I was in the middle, really, of this scene with Paul Morley. We were working for the NNA and we were sending pictures and copy back to London every week, telling them what was going on and Paul was making half of it up. When I would say, you know, Joy Division are just this incredible group, they're one of the greatest groups of all time, they're going to be as good as the Velvets, as good as Iggy. It would be a slight pat on the head and, and, and go off and polish your clogs kind of thing and go back down the mines. There was still an element of that. Because we were based in Manchester, we were able to make people in London quite excited about what was happening in Manchester. And I'm sure there were similar scenes in other cities in the country, but they didn't have people who were, you know, doing what Paul and I did. Going to the Electric Circus then was like going to a six-month festival, really. We just used to go and see everybody. We had the Jam, the Clash, the Ramones. Uh, you know, I mean, it was every week there was a big gig to go to. So it was pretty exciting. First time I saw Joy Division, they were supporting Buzzcocks at the Electric Circus. They were, at the time, they were called Stiff Kittens, and on the night, everybody thought it was a bit of a rubbish name, and Ian announced that they were Warsaw on the night. So they changed it about half a minute before they went on stage, by all accounts. Um, and they weren't very good, really. All dressed in uniform, so finely drank and killed to pass the time. We changed a lot initially when we started playing. We couldn't really play, to be honest. <laughs> well, we've all been learning. Yeah, it was very loose and just a bit of a fun thing, you know, how we're in a group, we're playing, you know, and uh, it was about August 1977, I think, when we really started getting our own particular way. It was Warsaw, they were almost on the verge of giving up, really. No one liked them, they were, you know, pretty ordinary. Uh, they weren't getting what they wanted, they weren't getting the attention they wanted, and they kind of felt on the outside of everything. And the first time I really felt that I saw the group we think of now as Joy Division was their, I think it was their third show. It was a kind of talent competition, if you like, you know, the Stiff Chiswick Challenge, where, you know, tons and tons of local groups suddenly knowing that they could be from Manchester and have a chance of a record deal, all did this kind of audition, it was like some kind of weird punk equivalent of the X Factor or something, you know. Of all the bands that night, they were the ones taking it the most seriously. And they were so angry that they might not get on, they were angry that people were holding them up, people like me were holding them up, and they got very, very, really angry. Kevin actually nearly cut short our career in Joy Division because he was in a group with Paul Morley at the famous Stiff Chiswick night where we were spotted by Tony Wilson, and they they kind of jumped in in front of us when we should have been playing and that we had a bit of a conflab at the time. I think Ian threatened to uh, hang Paul Morley probably. Um, so we had a bit of a conflab and they graciously stepped down and let us take the spotlight at this uh, concert that we were playing. They'd formed a group you see and we're going to uh, dazzle the world with the uh, their musical prowess. Yeah, I think my, our band, mine and Paul Morley's band, The Negatives, are legendary. And Bernard Sumner has said that if it wasn't for us, Joy Division wouldn't exist. There is an element of truth in that, because we thought, fucking bastards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they got us angry, really. So, and uh, as Johnny Rotten says, anger is an energy. <laughs> so angry, so pent up, so determined to impress people. That they, for me, they, you know, it sounds like you're making up history to an extent, but it was like that. I swear it was like that. They became Joy Division. They started to, you know, be harder, louder, more aggressive. The, 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 the sense of the relationship between the instruments started to gel, and Ian started to suddenly have that look in his eye because he was so pissed off. He, you know, he'd almost hit a few people, he'd kick down a door. So when he went on, he was, he was manic, and suddenly it was there. When you look at the light in a strange new room, maybe drown it soon. 
it was only really when they started working with Martin Hanna, who produced their first album, that suddenly people saw what they were capable of doing. And when that first album came out in, I think it was maybe June 79, we played a gig at the factory and Martin mixed the sound for it. And it was a completely different band to the one we'd seen a few months earlier. In sound, it was just, there was this deep, beautiful, deep sound that had come from nowhere we'd ever experienced before. Sometimes when I was standing at the front taking pictures and Ian was Ian looked like he was slightly out of control and he was quite, you know, his eyes were glazed and he was dancing like that. He was in his own little world. And I think for a photographer standing at the front, it's, it can be quite intimidating because you're not quite sure what he's going to do. I mean, the only other time I ever felt threatened by the lead singer in that way was... Iggy Pop at the Apollo, but he threw a chair at me. I mean, Ian didn't do that, but he did feel that he was slightly out of control. He just turned into a madman, you know. He's, I was like a bit astounded, really, while he's running about and, you know, getting very worked up about stuff. I thought, well, God, where's this come from? And it was a bit of a, it was a bit of a shock really the first time, the first time it happened. The famous, the, the famous Joy Division pictures of them in the snow in Hume, which became, you know, uh, irrevocably associated with Joy Division in people's minds. I think they, I think those pictures have set a kind of have been as much part of the Joy Division mythos as any of the music. <laughs> I love Kevin's work. Um, I think it's it's very gentle. And yeah, I suppose they helped me understand who my dad was and what he did, how he spent his time, you know, what his job was. Well, that iconic shot of Joy Division on the on the walking or the walkover bridge in Hume is kind of evocative of those times, 1979, the winter of discontent, all that, you know, the the, the overcoats. It kind of said came synonymous, kind of came like a Manchester image almost. So, I can't believe you've never been on that, this bridge before today, that's fantastic. Why would I? Well, I thought you might have wanted to recreate the moment, really. But plenty of other people in Manchester do. People now talk about it as the Joy Division Bridge. I call it the Joy Division Bridge. It's great, you know. But when we did the photographs that day, they had an idea, the band, that they wanted to do a picture on Princess Parkway queuing up for a bus. They thought that would be a great <laughs> right. idea for a shot. And I had an idea that I wanted to shoot them from the road, standing on the bridge looking away from Manchester, as if they couldn't wait to get out of it. Yeah. So I did the queuing up at the bus stop shot, about two frames, and did what they wanted, and I got them up here. And 
they walked out to the middle and as I was walking up the bridge I just thought how bleak it looked and the thing was covered in snow and I thought that makes such a great architectural shot of Manchester and they were so they were really incidental to it and I took three frames like that that's all I took but I knew that I'd got a, an interesting photograph out of it and then I came up here and took some of them with Princess Parkway in the background and so on but ultimately I thought yeah I've got I've definitely got at least one picture now that I can use and it was very much very unlike a rock and roll image, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Because most rock pictures at the time were close-ups of people straight into camera. And this was, you couldn't even see the band really on it. And so yeah. I didn't think the enemy had used it. So when we got back down there, I took a couple of Ian standing against one of the lampposts, yeah. just smoking. And I took maybe four or five frames of that. And again, it was my last roll of film and I was really worried that I'd have no film left and Bernard and Stephen were pulling faces behind Ian trying to make him laugh and I was thinking please please don't laugh I can't waste any film yeah so what do you think standing up here it's changed a bit as well yeah it's changed a lot wanted to portray this image of the serious young men. Um, the music was very sombre and serious and you know of course I've got two or three pictures of Ian laughing but again I was quite annoyed with myself for actually pressing the button when, when he was smiling because I thought well I can't use that now because that's not the kind of picture we wanted to use at the time. You know again with, with hindsight I'd have maybe shot several roles of Ian smiling, you know, for when the third album came out or something, I've no idea. But I think the fact that I edited carefully in the camera helps to make those pictures iconic because I'm waiting for the precise moment I want it. If there was a, t a feeling at the time that maybe it was a bit pretentious, it was a bit adolescent, it was a bit, you know, over the top and melodramatic, the fact that he actually then killed himself, you know, confirmed the, the, the absolute reality of his, of his desperate situation. Don't walk away. I maintain that if he'd come to us and said, you know, I've got a lot of problems, can we just like knock the band on the head for a few months while I sort myself out? You like to think that you said, oh, of course, Ian, yeah, of course, yeah. But you wouldn't, we were kids, we just said, hey, what's some of your soft get? Put yourself together, you know, because that's what you like. You're like the girl out of the exorcist. Right, <laughs> Spin your head round yeah, completely. Just step back about a four. Right. Look that way. Yeah. I was working with Bernard Sumner a few weeks ago for a German mag and we were laughing about it and saying I took his first photograph 32 years ago. So there's mutual trust and I think mutual admiration. Where is that? Bernard. 
Can I give you a bit of advice? That, I know you've been doing this for a long time. Yeah, go on, you give me a But I always put the date and the place on the back, so right? And then when you, when you come back in 30 years, you'll be able to know where it was. How to rate him as a photographer? Oh, God, I can't do that. A live review. Very good. Let's just say very good. He's very good and he makes the process um, a pleasant one, not an agonising one. So he gets a thumbs up from me. Well, if you look at Kevin's pictures, they're uh, like kind of um, extraordinary and very down to earth at the same time. And, and I think that's probably because he's kind of like that as a person. I think he's very modest, really, so... And you can see that in his work. He never really makes very much of a fuss, you know. I'm going to end up insulting the musicians, but, you know, without these photographs, it just wouldn't have, a, wouldn't have had the same impact. Um, I do think all these rock stars were very lucky to have Kevin as a photographer. I don't think since Kevin's pictures, there have been you know, pictures that people can remember. I, I, I mean, that may be me getting old, and I don't think it is that. I don't think there are those. It's an overused word, but Kevin's pictures are iconic, and I don't think there have been much like that since. I'm quite honoured that those pictures set the agenda for the way people view the band, because you know, when I was taking photographs of Joy Division, I wasn't taking them thinking that 25, 30 years on we'd still be talking about them. I was taking them for the NMA for the following week, and sometimes I was photographing them for them, you know, for the band. And we were all learning then. I'd just come out of college a year or so earlier, and they were learning how to be a band. There wasn't a set way to stand and look like a band and I had no preconceptions of how to do that, you know, so I think we were experimenting together. Love.